Let's see here. Uh, right, I'll get started. Let me begin with a word of prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, I uh, thank you for this class, and I uh, just ask you to guide our steps today, help us to uh, just glorify you what we do, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, let me begin with the definition of a geometry, right? A, a geometry is a... <sighs> probably talking to some other violet. Let's see here. <laughs> I have no idea. <clears throat> there we go. So a geometry is a vector space, a, and for, for us, a real vector space paired with a metric. So today we're going to talk about metrics, or a real, real metric geometry, I guess you could say, is what we're talking about. So definition, V um, over the reals paired with a metric G, which is, by the way, a what? Meaning that G is what? Right, where G is bilinear, bilinear form, which is three things, right? Number one, it's symmetric. It's symmetric, right? It is, um, oof. Goodness gracious, um, and it's not. I guess the three the three things is <laughs> the third first thing was bilinear, which I fa failed to enumerate. Um, so it's a bilinear symmetric non-degenerate form. Two, it's non-degenerate. Non-degenerate, and so here, meaning that uh, g of x comma y equals to zero. For all x and v implies y is equal to zero. Of course, you could you could equally well <coughs> phrase the uh, non-degeneracy with respect to the other input. It doesn't really matter because there's a symmetry between the inputs here, right? So we we have a bilinear form which is symmetric. Now, we also made a further definition, which was that if we have say uh, T, did I say T? Let me, it doesn't really matter what letter, I'll use L. So if we had L, a linear transformation um, on the vector space, then L is a G orthogonal, G orthogonal mapping if g of l of x comma l of y is equal to g of x comma y um, for all x and y in, in v, right? So that's a g orthonormal, g orthonormal mapping. And we also talk about, <coughs> um, you know, s equal to, let's say, v1 through Vn. We are, we are thinking of V as being finite dimensional here. Um, I don't think I have anything terribly cogent to say about the infinite dimensional case of metric geometry here. I, don't, I haven't thought about it, so I shouldn't say anything about it, you know? Um, I'm sure there are things to say, but I guess we'll save those for the final. But um, that, that's a joke. It's a joke. Uh, I feel like this time in the course I have to explain what the jokes are, because you guys are tired. Right? You're tired. I can see it on the quiz. Because I'm pretty sure if I asked that question again, you guys would just do it. It would be annoying, but you'd do it, right? Yeah, time. But uh, th there's time for integrating from zero to one polynomials. That doesn't take time. It's not the integration that takes the time. Yes. Well, anyway, there were some 
anyway, let's go on here. So, um, so yes, I mean, fair enough. I mean, implementing the Gram-Schmidt algorithm carefully does take time. So, this is is g orthonormal, or let's say g orthogonal, or g orthogonal. Um, if um, you know g of v i v j is equal to zero for i not equal to j. I don't think I actually have that in my definition in the book. I mean, my notes, I should say. Um, so I'm a little bit, a little bit antsy, uh, a little bit nervous to make this definition, but I think it's a good definition. That is what I'd mean by a G orthogonal set. I would be hesitant to try to define something called G orthonormal. And you'll see why as we go on. All right. Um, I'm not going to use the metric to define the length of a vector. Let me just say that. We cannot use a metric to define a norm on V, at least not, not a Euclidean norm. And I'm reluctant to try to extend the concept of norm to the non-Euclidean context, all right? A metric is already allowing for um, what you might call a non-Euclidean geometry. Um, okay, so anyway. Let me get into it here. So our first proposition is if we have um, v comma g, a real geometry, meaning what I just wrote over here, all right? Um, if, uh, you know, basis beta defines, come on, is used to define big G i j equal to, um, G of V I V J. All right. Then what can we say? The matrix big G uh, for G satisfies a few things, right? If you think back to what we did last class, we proved that the matrix of a um, matrix of a bilinear form is a thing, right? <laughs> and this is how we defined it by just, you know, letting it take in a pair of the bases, bases. And then we also proved that symmetric, if, if, if it was symmetric, if it's a symmetric bilinear form, its matrix is what? Symmetric. symmetric. So G transpose is equal to G. And we proved that the non-degeneracy of the metric implies invertibility of its matrix. So we have G transpose to G equals to that. And we also have the determinant of G is not equal to zero, right? Or if you like, it's invertible. G is an invertible matrix, right? So that's, that's to start with furthermore. If let's say you know L, let me use let me use um, I'll use T this time. If T is a mapping um, a, a, an endomorphism of V, a linear mapping from V to V, 
right, is G um, orthogonal. If that's a G orthogonal map, then um, of course, by definition, we have G of what? T of X, T of Y equals to G of X comma Y. So th this is not really part of the, pre th this is kind of a, uh, not a very good proposition. I'm now re restating the definition inside the proposition. I hope you can forgive me for this travesty of mathematical formatting, but for the sake of everyone understanding, this is what's assumed by saying T is G orthogonal, right? What does that mean about the matrix of T? If, you know, T beta beta equals to A, you know, is the matrix of T, as per our usual rules, then here's the deal. It will satisfy um, A transpose G A is equal to G again. The proof is not in my notes. Maybe we should work it out. Let me see if I've got time. Eh, maybe. Let's try. So, how would we work this out? How about this? We've got G of uh, T of VI T of VJ, right? Ah! Is equal to G of VI VJ, right? By assumption. And um, let's see here. Uh, um, So then I, I guess I just really need to remind ourselves, how do we write T of VI in terms of its matrix, right? So remember, um, to start with, let's remind ourselves that like if, if A is equal to T beta beta, then that's equal to what? Like we've got T of V1, coordinate vector of that, and so forth, right? Coordinate vector of that. At the moment, I can't use my snazzy inner product tricks because we're not in an inner product space. So I can't just select components like we have been. You know, I'm back to, back to basics again here. Um, all right, so, huh. So T of VI would be column I of A. T of VI would be col. well, that's not, this is an abstract vector though. Like yeah. If you, uh, yeah. So the formula for um, rats. Um, I'll eventually get it here. So my question is how to write. T of X in terms of that. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to. Well, yeah, I'm just trying to find the formula for T of X for the moment. Uh, I mean, really, I want to find the formula for T of VI in terms of A, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm really after, you know. Um, so uh, it, is, it is, of course, equal to phi um, beta inverse of phi beta 
of T of VI, right? T beta eats vectors, you know, I can do this. And then this is what? I mean, that is. So I think I'm about to get, you know, the, the equality of the coordinate vector with itself, if I'm not careful here. Um, yeah. What's that? A times VI. Yeah, I don't think that's tr true. I, I, a, a, a times the, well. What I wrote was not wrong, it's just not helpful. So if I go back to basics for a second here, we know that the matrix of T like this with on times the coordinate vector um, of X with respect to beta is equal to the coordinate of this, this thing, right? I don't know if that helps or not. Um, Uh, yeah, I mean the coordinate vector of EI is is EI by by definition essentially. Um, and the coordinate vector of T of VI is column I of T. Uh, I mean column I of A, with A being defined as. Hold hold on a second. You say what? The what? What do you say? Uh, the coordinate vector of T of VI. Uh huh. Is equal to the ith column of A with A being fine. Sure, yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll buy that, yeah. And then can't we then express that with the matrix of G? Like yeah, I, I... The column of, the ith column of A transpose times G times the J column Well, 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 I think we need to, did we prove last time that uh, G of X comma, I think we did this, right? This was equal to the coordinate vector of X with respect to beta times the matrix of G, transpose here, times the coordinate vector of Y. We actually did this, didn't we? But with a B instead of a G. Did we not prove that for a bilinear map? Like this is how to relate the matrix of the bilinear map to the coordinate vectors. Yeah, we did this. I should use this. Right, this is the uh, this is the bridge between the world of the metric and the world of the matrix of the metric. We should be using this, obviously. So, um, in view of that, I'm sorry, guys. I, I I will get it eventually. If I was smart, I should have just made this a homework problem, right? Am I working a homework problem right now? I don't think so. But um, all right. So this is what this is the matrix of T of um, yeah. right, yeah, beta transpose times the G matrix, right, um, times the coordinate vector of T of VJ transpose. No, not transpose. No, yeah, thank you, not transpose, not transpose, very good. So this is the coordinate vector of VI beta transpose times the matrix of T beta beta uh, transpose, which I really should have been using an A for because that's obnoxious, but oh well. Um, T beta beta coordinate vector VJ uh, beta. Translating it back into a more reasonable format. This is EI transpose A transpose big G A times EJ, right? But on the flip side, this is also equal to what? It's also equal to G of VI, VJ, right? Which, by the way, is the coordinate vector of VI transpose times big G times the coordinate vector of VJ with respect to the beta basis, which, incidentally, is EI transpose G times EJ. Now, let me take you back down memory lane. 
I mean, maybe it's not a memory that you have, but it's a memory you should have. It's a memory we should all share, which is that if we take a matrix and we hit it on the left and the right by a column vector, it selects the component. Like this is straight up the ijth component of a transpose g a i j, and this is straight up the ijth, trans, uh, ijth component of g. But we've showed this for arbitrary i and j. Therefore, a transpose GA is equal to G again. Okay, finally. So sorry. So the thing I was struggling with over here to start with is I wasn't, I was just not coming to terms with, I was basically, I was trying to rederive this without understanding that was what I was trying to do, which is why I was lost. So, anyway, I guess it's better to be lost in class than on a test, right? But, um, <laughs> all right, so, um, and these calculations are reversible, by the way, right? If I had that the matrix of a mapping did this, then I could, by these same calculations, infer that it is in fact a G orthogonal mapping. So what is the matrix of the metric for some examples that we know? Like what's the most common example? It's just the inner product case, right? Like just the Euclidean dot product, right? If we take V equal to Rn with G of X comma Y simply equal to the dot product, what's the matrix here with respect to the standard basis? It's what? Look at this. This is X transpose Y, which if you use your imagination, you can see that there's the identity matrix here. So big G, the matrix of the dot product, is the identity matrix. So, so this is so-called Euclidean geometry. Right? There we can define the standard distance between points and angles between line segments and all that stuff. Define the usual Euclidean geometry. And uh, in this context, we also have that the big G is simply the identity matrix. So what does it mean for a linear transformation on Rn to be G orthogonal? What is this, what is this A transpose GA equals to G translate into? Simply what? A transpose A equal to I. So in the context of Euclidean geometry, a G orthogonal transformation is simply A orthogonal transformation, right? This is the orthogonal matrix. A transformation is an orthogonal transformation if it's got an orthogonal matrix. We, we saw that before. Example two is not like this. Example two is quite removed from our usual experience. Um, and so I'll do a four-dimensional example. We'll let this is a typical notation, eta equal to the diagonal matrix with minus one up here and then three ones like that. All right. Then G of X comma Y equal to X transpose eta Y defines the so-called Minkowski metric. On R4, and this is thought of as time space. Okay, most people say space time, but honestly, time space would be a better label because the, the, the uh, first component is thought of as time here, right? And um, so like, if I take the inner product, well, not, excuse me, I shouldn't say inner product. If I take the metric of two four vectors, the formula is simply minus x0 upper y0 plus x1 y1 plus x2 y2 plus x3 y3. So it's like the dot product, and, but it's not the dot product, right? It's not. Um, why is this not an inner product? Yep. Uh, yeah, g of xx could be negative, very good. So like, that's a good observation. 
you have vectors with negative, so if I take like g of e1, e1, right? That's just minus 1 times 1, right? Plus zeros. So it's, it's minus 1, right? So we certainly don't have that g of xx is greater than or equal to 0. That is not, <laughs> it's not the case. It's not an inner product. The length of E1 is, uh, well, but we remember it's worse than that, isn't it, though? Because remember, our definition was this. Uh, see? It's I. So you'd, you'd, you'd probably want to say it's, yeah, it's I. It's length is imaginary. People do stuff like this. Uh, there's, there's a lot you could do there. I'm not going to talk about it here. <laughs> um, it's kind of fallen out of favor in current physics literature. But yeah, sometimes people did play games with like uh, using an, well, if you inject an I into this thing, you could turn it into a Euclidean. You could turn this into a Euclidean metric by taking your time coordinate and just adding an I onto it. Do you see that? If you did that, if you had like I X naught, I Y naught, then this would become a plus. This is known as a wick rotation in theoretical physics. which is um, something I don't entirely understand, to be completely honest with you. It's, it seems like a license to do things they're not supposed to be doing. It's one of those kind of, you see physicists do this particular kind of mathematics, and you're like, that just doesn't, anyway. Um, OK, but that, that's one problem. But there's another, right? How about this? What if we look at, so uh, you know, um, exhibit A not an inner product. Here's exhibit B. How about this? What if we had G of, say, 1, 1, 0, 0 with itself? What happens there? We get minus 1, plus 1, plus 0, plus 0, also known as 0. This kind of destroys all your hope of defining a norm using the square root of the inner product with itself, right? At least on the totality of the space, because this is troubling. This is known as a, a null vector. If you look at the equation which defines the set of all such things, right? So this is a particular example of it. So check it out. If we had minus t squared, plus x squared, plus y squared, plus z squared. If I just let an arbitrary null vector have the form, say, t, x, y, z, yeah? Then it would satisfy this equal to 0, which you might not recognize, but that is the equation of a cone. In two dimensions, it's easier to visualize. So if I... If I drop this example back down to, oh, let me just, I'm going to draw a two-dimensional picture, but truth be told, this is, of course, four-dimensional, but if you'll allow me this abuse, here's t and here's x, right? I mean, if you make this a two-dimensional example, if you make this a two-dimensional, ah, fine, example three, eta equals to minus one, one, zero, zero there. So then the, um, you know, the inner product of um, x and y would just be like um, minus x naught y naught plus x1 y1. This would be two-dimensional Minkowski space, two-dimensional time space. In this context, the equation this equals to zero. If you you know if you want to look at t equal to zero, you get literally a cone. Well, okay, okay, fine. It's still not a cone, is it? Like this is a, it's a pair of lines, you know? These are the ones that have, um, this is what? This is like the span of um, 1, 1. Span of what? Yeah, 1 minus 1. Those vectors, 
any vector on those two purple lines, Minkowski product with themselves are zero. These are null vectors. And, and this is called the null cone. Actually, you know what? It's not usually called the null cone. You know what it's usually called? It's usually called the light cone because these are the, the paths which light follow. And then if you look at it, there are two other possibilities, which is you have vectors which are like inside the light cone and you've got vectors outside the light cone. So you've got vectors like in here, like this one. Um, <clears throat> this would have, this would have what? If I may, may call this thing V and let me call this one over here W for the sake of discussion. So like what would G of V, V be? Is it, what, what, what's the deal here? Time is what? It's bigger than space? This would be negative, right? On the other hand, G of W, W would be positive, right? Because over here, the spatial is bigger than the temporal, temporal component. So this is t so-called time-like vector. And this is a space-like vector. If you think of your current position in space-time as the origin, if you look at it, <clears throat> you can only reach points inside the light cone that are time-like separated from the origin. Those are paths corresponding to a, a speed which is, is less than the speed of light. If you go to points out here, you need to travel a trajectory which has a speed greater than the speed of light. So, so this is the, the physical motivation for this example is, of course, Einstein's special relativity. His teacher was Minkowski and um, one of his teachers, I suppose. And Minkowski pioneered some of these ideas. But um, so uh, this is an example of a hyperbolic geometry for reasons I don't want to get into too much at the moment. Um, but obviously this is a non-Euclidean geometry because it's not an inner product, right? So like generically speaking, a vector space with an inner product in some sense or another defines a Euclidean geometry, which is the one we're used to in mathematics, you know? Um, all the nicest results hold for that case. Um, so you can define perp in this context just the same. Like, what would the perp be in a, in a you know, ge in a, in a real geometry definition, you know? For W, a subspace of V, where you know V comma G is real geometry, then W perp, what would it be defined to be? X in V such that what? G of X comma W equal to what? How about? zero, right? And that's for what? For all W and W, right? So we can define the perp. We can find the so-called G orthogonal complement in a real geometry, just like we did in the case of like inner product spaces, right? But that's kind of as far as it goes. Let me show you an unpleasant example. <laughs> um, so in our Minkowski, in a four-dimensional Minkowski space, right? Let me go back over here. In our four-dimensional Minkowski space, you guys look at the look at the um, half of the. Well, let's look look at a line on the light cone, right? A line on the light cone, example four here. I'm continuing with my four-dimensional time space. So if we look at W equal to the span, let's say, of the vector. 1, 1, 0, 0, right? What's W perp? We're looking at T, X, Y, Z, such that what? G with this, right? Which is what? I'm just going to write it down. Minus T plus X equals to 0, right? That's the condition that G on the basis for W is zero. And that automatically makes any scalar multiple of it zero as well, right? So what is this? You're just looking at what? Um, we could do like TT 
YZ. So W perp is, is uh, it's three dimensional. That feels right. This is one dimensional, so yeah. But um, mm, mm, look at this. Well, it's the span of what? One one zero zero, zero zero one zero, and zero 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 one. That's W perp. Did you see something funny about this? A little bit, kind of a little bit funny about it. W is a subset of W perp, yeah. Ooh. And W intersect W perp, then apparently in this case is just W again, which of course is not equal to zero. And um, we're still, what's, is W plus W perp, uh, is, that, is that all of time space? It's not. It's not. It's, it's not equal to R4. So, um, the, yes? What is the definition of W perp not minus T plus X plus Y plus Z equals zero? Why is... Because... Oh, okay, so, yeah, fine. Go on, you can explain if you want, Josh. Because it's the T, X, Y, Z, it's G of... T X Y Z comma one one zero zero, so it ends up being you know, negative T times one plus X times one plus Y times zero plus Z times zero, so the Y and Z go away. Yeah. And, and I mean, I mean, if you want me to be fussy, a typical element in the span, there's a you know a scalar multiple here, right? I'll put a lambda there because people like to use lambda as a scalar. It doesn't just have to be an eigenvalue, you know? So just saying. Not picking a fight with anybody in particular here. Just saying. Um, so yeah. Now, there is a name for the g-orthogonal maps of um, Minkowski space. So, if you have, you know, um, L a mapping uh, a linear map on um, R four here with you know the big, you know, the matrix with respect to the standard basis equal to the eta, then um, if the matrix of L is equal to, say, lambda, then you'd need lambda transpose eta, lambda equal to um, eta again. And this, what I just defined there, what I just put a box around, these four by four matrices that satisfy this condition, these are known as Lorentz matrices. So, a Lorentz matrix. It's the matrix of what's called the Lorentz transformation. A Minkowski orthogonal transformation is a Lorentz transformation. These include rotations of the spatial coordinates. So like some nice examples I mean, I can tell you a little bit more just offhand. Hopefully, I'm not doing your homework. If I am, so be it. Um, oh man, I gotta stop. There are other things just to cover today. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm supposed to cover the musical morphisms. I better get to it, huh? So, where should I erase? Yowzers. I should have resisted the temptation to prove this today. I'm sorry. I lack discipline. <clears throat> so, here's the deal. The musical morphisms we could define using the inverse to the matrix of the metric. All right. Oh, rats. Oh, I, I hate that I'm not talking about that other thing. Uh, I mean, I mean. Definition. <laughs> um, if 
we have V comma G, a real geometry, right, with <clears throat> matrix big G um, for G with respect to basis beta, right? Then we define G upper IJ to be equal to the IJth component of the <coughs> inverse of the matrix. All right. The IJth component of the inverse of the matrix, hence, essentially by definition, we have the formula that the sum k equals 1 to n of g upper i k, g lower um, k j equals to Kronecker delta i j. And we define musical morphisms as follows. For x equal to the sum i equals 1 to n of x upper i, v lower i, and alpha equal to a sum i equals 1 to n of alpha lower i, v upper i. So here, this is an element of what? The dual space to v, right? Where v i Vj is defined how? It's the, it's the dual basis we've talked about before, all right? Then the flat map on x upper i is equal to x lower i, which is defined by contracting the components of the vector against the components of the inverse to the metric. There is a kind of joke of notation going on here. The upper eye and the lower eye are canceling out. My bad, there was supposed to be a Oh, come on, seriously? Dudes, there's a typo in the notes right here. Most unfortunate, that's supposed to be upper J. And also the sharp of alpha lower eye is equal to alpha upper i, which is equal to the sum um, j equals 1 to n of alpha lower i, g upper i j. So did I say we use the, the inverse metric to lower the components? That's wrong. I just use the metric components to lower the components of x and, um, you know, so the theorem from this, which I guess I need to admit defeat and use the projector here, but so the 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 the, the flat. So let me let me try to explain the the joke here for you guys. In physics, we talk about covariant and contravariant components. Covariant, like the components of a, <clears throat> of a dual vector are covariant, and we write those components down. The components for a vector, they're contravariant, and we write those, com those coordinates up, all right? When you change basis, these components transform inversely. So like, um, Make sure before I end up with some kind of thing I have to edit out. <laughs> Let's see if I can find it. Here we go. So the, the joke here is that it's a flat because you're doing what? You're, you're lowering the index, right? 
It's a sharp because you're raising the index. You're going from a contravariant index to a covariant in index, and over here from a con covariant to a contravariant. And um, so these can be put together. I mean, we can use these in particular to define an isomorphism from V to V dual like this. So like psi of X is equal to flat of Xi with V upper I. This gives me the components of a dual vector. And so, yeah. And the proof is given right here. So it's, um, <clears throat> Let's see here. So if I take psi of x and I let it act on y, I get um, <clears throat> this acting on y. But remember how v upper i acts on y? It selects the ith component of y. So that just changes this to an i. But at that point, you've got gij x upper j y upper i, which is, this is our formula for gyx expanded in components. And once you write that, Obviously, this is linear both in X and in Y because G is a bilinear form, right? So this proves at once that the formula defines a dual vector and also that the mapping psi of X is linear. We get both at once. So we get this is a linear mapping and it's mapping where it's supposed to, right? It's actually producing dual vectors. Um, and then here I calculate the kernel, I show it's zero based on the non-degeneracy of the metric, um, which then of course shows me that the psi is a bijection. Um, but I also just proved the surjectivity using the, the sharp map just for fun. Um, so like, let's see here what I do. Well, anyway. So, I'm sorry guys, I wanted to talk more about this, but um, I will talk more about it next class. I'm sorry your homework still do, but um, because we're just out of time. So just do your best and, you know, I, I, I think if you just digest these de definitions, you'll, you'll get it. But um, the Reitz vector is that Y that we talked about before. So like we took a dual vector, remember alpha? And we found alpha of x was equal to the inner product of x with a specific y. So that y is the vector that corresponds to alpha. That's the Reitz vector, it's the name of it. In this case, in the context of um, a metric space, in this, uh, like this metric geometry, the, the, sh the, uh, the sharp of alpha is exactly that vector. And this, this, this formula shows you that it works. If I take g of sharp alpha, x, it is going to give me back alpha of x when I work through the calculation here, which is exactly what we constructed in, in a very indirect way from the book for the inner product case, right? And of course, we're also fussing with complex things there, but um, yeah. So anyway, if you do need help with this, you know, feel free to ask me about it. I'll try to hold a special office hour tomorrow to help you if you've got questions. So, all right? Yeah. So does the bilinear form um, convert from vector space to dual space? Does the bilinear form convert? Say your question again. Is the bilinear form in this case used to convert, so to speak, um, vector space spaces to dual space spaces? Hmm. We can definitely extend the flat the flat map. If I was if I had a little bit more time, we could use the flat map to do exactly what you're saying, to take a basis for v and convert it to a basis for the the dual. And I think if we do this, if we do this idea with respect to the Euclidean, like the dot product in the process of taking the, sharp, the flat map of the standard, like the basis for V, with respect to its inner product, I'm pretty sure we're gonna get the dual basis if we do that construction for an inner product. So, but it's, it's using the metric to get, to convert. Anyway, so, 
we'll talk more about it next time. I'm sorry I didn't talk about it more today. <sighs> So sorry guys.